Lord Jesus, your word is life. Your word is penetrating to our heart. It's piercing to our soul. It's food to our spirit. So Holy Spirit, we invite you in to do anything you want to do. Bring us to memory the things that we need. Enlarge the territory of our, of our field, of our scope of ministry, God. May it reach beyond ourselves to our family, beyond our family to our co-workers, beyond our co-workers to our friends. God, please, may your word transform us from glory to glory tonight. We need you, God, and we love you. And pray these things in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Going through the book of Esther, if you were here last week, we started in chapter 1. We looked at the kingdom of Asuras, otherwise known as Xerxes, and Queen Vashti. If you guys remember Queen Vashti, she decided she wasn't going to parade herself for this king. Well, most scholars agree that in between chapter 1 and 2, there is a long gap. Some would say as many as two years, some say less. But there is a gap, and we're going to show you where it comes in. But let me give you a little bit of the background. This king, Asaurus, he wanted to invade Greece. He was mad because his father attacked Greece, and Greece repelled them. And he wanted vengeance. Now, if you want to look this stuff up, you can look at some of the historical records of these things. The great thing about the book of Esther, it's historically accurate, like impeccably. Um, there's a historian, a very famous historian called Josephus. He tells the story of Esther also. Incredibly interesting. However, given all this history, as a matter of fact, if you guys remember the movie 300? That was about the Persian Empire that attacked Greece and the, how the 300 repelled. Now, even though they lost that battle, Greece did in the end, they, so bad was their defeat, how many men they lost, it, they lost all taste for battle. They say that that very battle, I think it's called Thermopylae, was in between these two chapters. Now what had happened was, if you weren't here last week, in chapter 1, Ahasuerus trying to um, encourage his leadership to back him in his attacking of Greece, he did anything they wanted. Oh, let's have a party. So for 180 days, they had a party. And then he threw a drunken party for another week and so forth and so on. And then his queen wouldn't show up. And they said, oh, here's what you got to do. You got to get rid of her and get a new queen, blah, 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 blah. If you weren't here, I suggest you read the chapter one later on and you'll get a feel for it. However, now, a year or so later, some would say, this is where we pick up our story. After these things... When the wrath of King Asuras subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Please give me your attention. Let me give you a little bit of insight plus a little bit of the message. Let's apply the message a little bit. They go to war after he deposed Vashti. If you weren't here, real quick, Vashti refused to come in and entertain them. Um, by her beauty, so he deposed her. He took, he literally removed her from being a queen. Then they go to war, they come back, and he remembered. Oh, yeah. I'm mad at her. Now, when you come back from war and you've been defeated, you know what you want more than anything else? A little comfort. But, listen, he did some really dumb things. And now, I want you to think about if Queen Vashti becomes queen again, what do you think she's going to do to all of his leadership guys, all of his princes and, and governors and satraps that had, he, that had her deposed? <laughs> you better believe it. So they ain't going to let that happen. So they have to come up with a really good idea because here's a king who's lonely. He's just been defeated, even though he was victory. There's nothing worse than being defeated in victory to begin with. He wants to forgive his wife. But can he? Now he looks like an idiot in front of his friends. And they're freaking out because if she becomes queen again, they got problems, big problems. You understand what's going on here? Now, application-wise, listen, 
guys, we, we kind of went to town on the ladies last week, and we had a lot of fun with them. Guys. If you're mad at your woman, and you can't remember why you're mad at her, chances are it's best to let her go. You might be new at this little thing called relationships, but let me give you a few little hints, guys. Number one, you're never going to win. Don't even make believe to try. It's just not going to happen. Don't keep track of the wrongs and the rights. It doesn't matter. Don't ever say to yourself, especially out loud, or even think about it, okay, this time I'm gonna let it go, but next time I'm not. Because you could look at your watch and in 15 minutes you're gonna have another hassle with that same opportunity, <laughs> but this time you're not gonna let it go. Let it go. Go put on Billy Joel's song, She's Always a Woman to Me and let that torture your heart because that's the truest song ever written about a woman. You're not gonna win. Let it go. As my daughter Arlie used to always tell me, Daddy, build a bridge, get over it. <laughs> You're just not gonna win. It's just not gonna happen. It's just not worth it. If she cheated, if she walked away from God, okay, send her down the road. Anything else, anything else, anything else, <laughs> forget it. You're just not going to win. You finish the statement for me. Happy wife. If mama ain't happy, why do you think they made these sayings up? Why do you think we all know it? Let it go. Unfortunately, this king was surrounded by very shrewd servants. Verse 2, then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel in the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king, I'm sorry, who pleases the yes, who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Let me get your attention again. Let me explain a couple of things. In case you weren't here last week, they were in Shushan the Citadel, which was the winter quarters of the Iranians. I said Iranians, yes, the Persians or actually modern day Iranians. And they had a summer kingdom and they had a winter kingdom. So they went to the winter kingdom and under the king's eunuch, if that word eunuch is new to you, that is a man who was castrated, gelded, had his testicles removed so that he could be in a position of a... Th and I said that that baby is looking at me. Guys, look at the way that baby's looking at me. <laughs> what? He did what? He did what? I said that. Had it, and she looked. That was great for the purpose of king's service to the women. Now, what he's giving up, obviously, is a life of, of sexual intimacy, but what he's gaining is, is a close confidant of the king. And usually kings had what's called a harem, or concubines, and then they had a wife or multiple wives, depending on where they were. It's very possible that Queen Vashti wasn't deposed at all when it came to her power and status, because, again, if you weren't here last week, does anybody remember who some said Queen Vashti's grandfather was? King Nebuchadnezzar, who the book of Daniel tells all about King Nebuchadnezzar, who was literally called the King of Kings, obviously not referring to the Lord Jesus, small k. 
Continuing, so what happens is, I'm um, sorry, so what happens is his servants get together and they say, you know what you need more than anything else? A beauty pageant. A beauty pageant that at the end, you get the winner. Now, at one point he's like, yeah, I'm pretty mad at Vashti, but I'm not that mad. Beauty pageant, huh? Yeah, you know what, who needs her? And that's exactly what they did. I want you to see, and the reason I'm overplaying this whole underlying undercurrent thing here it's really important to the course of the book as you go out if you've ever watched the shows that talk about the different kingdoms whether it be european kingdoms or middle eastern kingdoms whatever it is there's always this constant struggle does the king have all the power do the servants have all the power who is the it is an amazing undertow the current that pulls the the king's heart in each direction or queen's heart is extremely important to understand. That's why these things are going on that are going on. Why did he depose his queen? Well, because she embarrassed him and all the servants said so. And they wanted, well, why did he go along with what they said? Because he wanted to take them to war. And then once he took them, they took them to war, they lost. Now he wanted to make them happy, but he didn't want to lose his king. They didn't want her to become. You have to see all those little nuances that go on in these stories. It's extremely important. You'll see as, as we go through the book, why that makes sense. Okay, this thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of... Shimei? 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 I know that name. Does anybody remember that name, Shimei? This very same Shimei. Anybody remember? Hands, anybody? There's David, just got deposed himself from his kingdom. He's leaving town, walking along a ridge, and above him, you remember him? What did he do, do you remember? Huh? Yes. David is walking. Shimei is standing on the ridge above him, kicking rocks at him, throwing stones at him, cussing him out. There's David, blood on your hands, your kingdom. He cussed him from one side to the other, and one of, one of David's mighty men said, let me take this dog's head off. David said, no. Maybe it's the Lord. Maybe there's something in this for me. And this is so also vital as an application. Sometimes when somebody's saying something to you, even if they're not saying it the right way, maybe there is something in it for you. And maybe getting angry and pushing them away at first. My wife always says this thing to me, and it's, it's, it's kind of a personal thing, but I'm going to tell you guys anyway, because maybe there's something in it for you guys. My wife always says to me, Ryan's an angry bear. And angry bears, they don't want to be alone, but angry bears are alone. So if Ryan doesn't want to be alone, he shouldn't be an angry bear. <laughs> and you know what I say to her? Shut up, Queen Vashti. <laughs> and she goes like this. Is she over there? Yeah. <laughs> oh. I've been living there. <laughs> Why is this important? Why did I just... Listen, this is... Guys, this is what I love about the Word of God with no explanation. Now, we're going to learn next chapter. If you just turn the page real quick to chapter 3. Look at this man. After these things, King Asaurus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite. You see the Agite? Who is the Agite? Anybody? Agite, 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 Agite. That reminds me of the King Agag. Wait a second. I know that king's name. Where was that king's name from? Listen. Do you remember Nathan, the first king of all Israel? I mean, Saul, the first king of all Israel? He was told by Nathan to kill all the Agites, including King Agag. He doesn't do it, showing mercy where mercy was not supposed to be shown. One of the byproducts of his disobedience to God. Haman. 
What did Haman, what are we going to learn about Haman next, next week? That he wanted to destroy all of the Jews. He was literally the first Hitler. Because of Saul's disobedience, Haman is born who wants to destroy all the Jews, God's chosen, which would have cut the whole line off that would have brought the Messiah. But, if you know the story, and the protagonist, the hero of our story, is Mordecai. Mordecai only lives because of the mercy of David, who didn't cut this guy's head off, Shimei. So it was David's mercy that brought about Mordecai, who because of him, the Jews don't get killed because of the mercy that mistakenly, disobediently... This is incredible. I love these little things. If your mind's not blown, then you don't know the word of God, what I'm talking about, and I suggest you look it up. King Agag should have been killed, and because he wasn't killed, Haman was born, thus wanted to destroy the whole line of Jews. But it was the mercy of David just a few years later that brought about Mordecai, who defeated him. Oh, I told you the end of the story. Oh, this is so cool. In Shushan the Citadel, verse 5, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the, the son of Akish, a Benjamite. Who else was a Benjamite? Saul. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, son of Judah, I'm sorry, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther. So what's Esther's real Jewish name? Hadassah. That is Esther, his uncle's daughter. If it's his uncle's daughter, who is it? His cousin, right? So Mordecai has a little cousin. Now when I think about it, I think about Cammy, like my, my 10-year-old daughter Cammy. She has a little cousin. I'm sorry, she has a little niece. Boy, this makes, this does not connect at all. Never mind. This is a cousin. Boy, I, I, I thought about this too much. Having a cousin that's so much younger than you, Listen, listen to the rest of this verse first. For she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Through all of this traveling that they've done, Nebuchadnezzar taking them captive, them going back and forth from Jerusalem um, to, to um, Babylon, this Hadassah, her parents die. Now, I want you to think about what kind of young woman this is. Now, some say she was 12, 13, tops 15 years old. This girl is tough. She was brought up in a world of pain. She was brought up in a world of suffering. This chick, let me tell you something. This was no pushover, this girl. She had something that God looked at and said, I can use this girl. She's tough as nails. Now, looking at her life, one would think to themselves, she can really curse God. She can look and say, oh, great life you've given me. Thanks so much. I hate you, as some people do. You took away my mother. You took away my father. I have nothing. I have to live with my cousin. We live in poverty. We're slaves. We're slaves. Mordecai, what kind of guy is this? Cousin? Cut. You know, there's kind of a weird thing, and, and, and I find it, please don't let me be um, racist sounding when I say this, but amongst certain people groups, I find they tend to do this. Like Italians, the way I grew up in, as an Italian, we did this. If my cousin's parents, like I had, we had a lot of cousins, we had a lot of family. If their parents were getting divorced, they were going through it, they would just come and live with us. And we found out that a lot, of, a lot of people groups don't do that. Irish people, man, I, I, oh, my brother, he lives on his side. You ever see him? No, I don't see him. Now, I know somebody Irish here can say, oh, that's not true because I know. 
I'm just going by my experience. That's right. I, I don't want to sound racist. But I also find that in the African American community. Grandparents raising their, their cousins, nieces, nephew. And, and I find that more now in the life that I'm living now, I find it more than ever in the African American community. That they're raising each other's kids, nephews, they're raising their exes. I know this ex husband's wife's sister's kid didn't have a place to go, so we took him in. You got six kids, what are you doing? You know who does that? She's not here tonight, let's talk about her. Felicia. You know a girl Felicia that comes in? Lately she's been coming in with a uniform because she's driving an uh, armored truck now. This, bless this woman's heart. This girl will take any kid in. And she says, she has no money. She's just a hard, you talk about a hustler? You want sneakers? She has friends in the sneaker shop. She'll get the sneakers for you. You want to buy snakes? She knows somebody who breeds the snakes. I mean, I'm telling you from one side to the end, she'll work. This girl is a clipping queen, let me tell you. If you go in my office now, I've got um, three cases of Insure. Here, Pastor, you could have these. I got these for free from clipping. <laughs> Felicia, why don't you? She, you go on, she has five websites. She sells her stuff on offer. Listen, if you ever want to bless a sister when you come here and if your heart's like, eh, hey, let me pay your rent this month. Let me pay your electricity for next month. This woman will take anybody's kids in. Like the last kid she took in, smoking, drinking, partying. She don't get, oh, maybe I could help her. You want to bring that around you? I just love that. I love that type of person. This is what we're dealing with here. These, these Jews of this day, my cousin has no place to go. I'll raise her as mine. Now, we don't know how close they were in age, which is interesting, and I, I think that adds a little bit of twist. What if she was only a couple years older, but it's my cousin, no touchy, you know what I mean? What if she was a lot older, and she, I, you don't know this, and, and there's a lot of dynamic there, and I'm kind of mad that I don't know that dynamic. I want to know that. I can't wait to get him. Now, how old were you? But why is it really germane? Because as the chapters go by, you're going to see this Hadassah, now known as Esther, do some things, and you're going to go, wow. Wow. Guys, you ever hear the verse, for such a time as this? Guess where it's from. We're going to hit that in about two chapters. This is a woman. This is what God's women were meant to be. Fearless. Warriors. I just, I have this picture of this girl Esther. I have dirty nails and, and matted up hair. I'm sure Mordecai didn't take care of her. You know, sand everywhere in her face, and, and there she's just a little kid. But you could look at her and see the, the beauty in her. You could, man, that's, she's such a, what a smile. Just like you, Sarah. I did. It was beautiful. Continuing. Eight, thank you. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai that Esther also was taken into the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance now here's this girl and there's something about her but this head guy or head guy whatever whatever you pronounce that he's one of the king's eunuch he sees her and he says i like you there's something about you there's just you ever meet that person there's something about you you're, you're tough you're, but there's something about you. Like, you know, he's got to be gathering all these women, maybe something odd. But there's a, something of that smile. And it wasn't her beauty at the time. I guarantee you that, I, I mean, can you, <laughs> can you see Mordecai getting this? Oh, there, listen, the winner of this thing gets to live in the king's palace Listen, I want you to live in the king's palace. I want you to have it better than I can offer it to you. I want things better for you than me. Why would he give his daughter that he's raising, his cousin that he's raising as his daughter, why would he give it to the king? To be some concubine? Because I want, I want you to take care of yourself better than I can take. I want you to be, I want you to have it better. 
And could you see him brushing her hair and taking care of her? Maybe like putting a little, and here she goes, you know, maybe 14, 15. <laughs> but there's something about this girl, man. There's something about her. Aside from the fact that the favor of the Lord was upon her. And we can do a whole study every single week about when the favor of the Lord is upon you. That's an anointing, man. That is like a pink anointing that God rubs on your spirit. You got favor. Why do you got favor? Some people just have the favor of the Lord upon them. That's, we'll, we'll talk about that another week. Now the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. So through this favor, she's got these women that are taking care of her. Now, anybody ever go to a day spa? I'm the only one that hasn't gone. I never went to a day spa. This is what you call the ultimate day spa. Watch. Esther had not revealed her people or her family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Now, the first hint that you get that there's something that this girl has that's more than a little special is the line that we just read that might have, you might have missed it. Mordecai groomed her. Mordecai took care of her. Mordecai raised her. And then Mordecai says, don't tell anybody where you're from. Well, wait a second. She's now in good favor with the king's own eunuch. She's got maidservants herself now. She's in. She's, she's in the best house of the women. Hey, cuz, thanks. I mean, sad to say this, and, and, and I'm not trying to dredge up any old memories. Has any of you guys ever taken care of somebody so good, and as soon as they made it, they're just like, bye. There's a, there's, a, there's a Bible verse that I hold on to. I don't hold on to it too tightly, but I do hold on to it. It says, he who returns evil for good, evil will never depart from their house. When, when, you, when you take care of somebody, when you do somebody right and they do you wrong, it burns, it, it, it beckons, it beckons to the root of your heart to putrefy it. It wants to grab a hold of your heart and make you bitter and ill and... I did that. I can't believe it. You know what? God's going to take care of it. God's going to take care of it. Don't let that happen. Especially you guys that have, that have businesses. How many of your employees, like, you give them money up front, you take care of them, you buy them this, you buy them that. Sorry. Sorry. Somebody else offered me a dollar more an hour, so I'm leaving. Remember when I caught you stealing and I let you come back? <laughs> you remember when you needed money to buy your house? And I gave you the money. It, it calls to your heart. It says, be bitter. Be angry. Carry this around. In New York, we used to have these buses where the uh, bus driver used to have the handle. And you should turn it one direction. Tss, open the door. That's what it does. Every time that happens, it's like that bus driver. Tss, come on, get on the bus with me. I want to carry you around for the next 30 years of my life and hate your guts. This girl ain't like that, guys. You know what this girl said? My cousin told me not to say nothing, so I ain't saying nothing. But these people are taking good care of you. Nobody's going to take good care of me like Mordecai took care of me. You know what you look like when you came to us? You look like a ragamuffin. I don't care. That's my cousin. That's my dad. He told me what to do and say. And look at what Mordecai did. Every day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the woman's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. He didn't just drop her off and go, okay, bye. She's not mine anymore. It says that every day, 
whether it was before work or after work, I don't know, but he obviously had to work. He had to make, he would pace back and forth. And, Is Esther okay? Tell her more to, tell her uncle, cuz, whoever I am to her, I love her. <laughs> Just pace back and forth. Hey, did you, did you, did you hear anything about it? what's going on in there? King he mistreating her, is he? didn't make a one of his, okay, okay. Just see, you gotta see this, you gotta look. Guys, you gotta dig into this story and, and you gotta see these things there. Cause it's not like they're not there. I'm not seeing into it. This is what he's saying. To learn of es Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each woman's turn came to go into King Hesaurus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. <laughs> Ooh, remember I talked about a day spa? How many months? This is a day spa that lasted 12 months. She said, sign me up. <laughs> now listen to the preparations of this day spa, right? Ready? Six months with oil of mare and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. So the first six months, all they did is rub you down every day with mare. Just a little, little butter, a little, little uh, what do you call it? Cocoa butter, a little cocoa butter. A little cocoa butter. Get that hair, get that, get those knots out of you. Can you see her? Stop! Will you? This is what we, and there's that unit coming in. I'm saying, are you giving these servants trouble again? They're trying to brush my hair again, Hagar. Now, I know your cousin calls you Adassa, and I call you Esther, but don't make me go get him. Okay, okay, I just see this whole thing going on, man. I see it. First six months, just got to get her skin soft. Why does her skin need to be soft? Because this girl's been wandering around. Who knows what she's been doing out there in the desert. Her skin is probably boiled and cooked, and she's probably got fingernails. She's, they, it probably took 12 months to grow the mats out of her hair. And then six months, learning how to put on makeup and learning how to walk and learning how to talk and... Verse 13, thus prepared each young woman went into the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters of the king to the king's palace. In the event she went and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women to the custody of Sheazgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the, king's, into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called her by name. Let me explain to you what's going on here. Now, there's a little bit that we don't understand here, but here's what really happened. So when it was time for them to be able to see the king, at night, she was ushered in. And she got to wear whatever she wants. She got to bring whatever she wants. And she'd go in there, and she would be, she would have to please the king and if, after that night was over, she'd go in with Sheazgaz to the king's concubine. There was the wife's, and there was the concubine. All of them were taken care of. To be the king's concubine wasn't a bad gig. You didn't have to work. You sat around and waited for the phone call. You're up. All right, I'm up. <laughs> or you never got called back, depending on whether you pleased the king or not. That's the, uh... <laughs> now watch, though, what happened here. Now when it was, the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter. Now I want you to see something that's very, very important here. He repeats a line again here. Why did he go through this whole thing again? Whenever you're reading the Bible, whenever you see something that looks out of place, or you don't know why it's there, that should be some place where you put a signpost with a big X that says, dig here. Dig here. Look deeper here. There's something here that you should know about. Just keep that in mind. When you're reading the Bible and you go, why did he say that again? Why did it say it like that? Why did he repeat himself like that? You guys remember when we were going through the book of John, early in the book of John, the Lord Jesus said, sent, like, 
40 times in two chapters. So we, we put them on the board, we said, sent, 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 like this obsession. Why? Well, that's a signpost. Dig here. Same thing here. Now, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Listen, this loyalty to her, it was ingrained here. It was taught, it was learned, and it was kept. This guy took care of her. And when it was time to come in, she wasn't like, after a year of being spoiled and pampered, and she wasn't like, excuse me, I'll take it from here. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I meant. I was a little on the uh, feminine side. I don't... She said, she said, to Hag, she said to Haggai, the, the eunuch, what, what should I bring in? Well, you've been here a year. We've taught you. Now you go and do your thing. You tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. <sighs> he must have loved this girl. Come here. And he told her what to wear, what to do. And the implication is this. Although the other women that came in to the king's quarters, he had his way with, there was something about her. There was a purity spoken of. There was something that he didn't. That he didn't. And so important is it for ladies, you sisters, to foster the most important in a society that tells you sex sells, in a society that tells you, come on, push them up, stick them out, make them work. You don't. And you will find favor with God in a way that will reveal to you, that will bring to you the riches that you really desire and not the attraction of a man or a woman, not the job that you got because you look better than the other girl. But when your beauty is from the Lord, this girl wasn't interested in what the other girls had. Tell me how to dress. Tell me what to say. Tell me what to do. Man, I want to see, you know, you ever go into, some people have the pictures of what they look like. I want to see what she started out with. There's this tough little dirt girl, this little sand girl. All of a sudden, yeah, she's here. I want to see all, and then after a year, she walks out. Could you imagine Mordecai after a year going, I knew it. Did anybody ever watch Rocky 1? when she's got the glasses on and the hat and, and Adrian, and all of a sudden he takes the hat off and he takes the glasses off and he pushes her head back. I knew you was beautiful. He saw something in her that was beyond what, it was an inner beauty. The, the Bible says this, ladies, that God makes everything beautiful in its time. There is no woman in God's eyes that doesn't have beauty, no matter what. Instagram, Facebook, or any other medium tells us. So Esther was taken to King Asuras into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is in the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. Remember I told you this book, more than anything else, has more feasts, more parties. These Persians were known as party people, big time. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. When the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. L-O-Y. A. L-T-Y. 
Loyalty. However it's spelt, it's the same thing. The girl, she has something that you can't buy, that you can't teach. It's a gift. Loyalty. In my family, in my life, loyalty is everything. Everything. 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, the doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Asuras. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name and were hanged on gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Please give me your attention. Here's where we finish it. Here's where we see. Romans 8.28 says what? All things work together for good to them that love God, to those who called according to his purpose. Right? When I was growing up, I always wanted to be a rock star. I did. I wanted to be a rock star. I, I moved to Florida in my 20s because I wanted to join a rock and roll band, and the scene in Florida was good. I had no idea that the only reason God was leading me in that direction, yes, even in my wicked days, allowing these open, open these doors, is so I would know how to run a sound system because in the future I was going to have a church. And I'd need to know how to run a sound system. God, I'm sure at one point said, oh, you think you're going to be a rock star? No, no, no. I got something better for you. No, no, I want to be a rock star. No, just keep learning that. You're going to need to know to run all that sound equipment. We're going to use it later on. And I can give you all the areas in my life where God allowed me to be so he would use it later on. You're going to be a business owner. Why do you want to be a business owner? Because you've got to learn how to run a church. Well, what does a church and a business have to do with each other? There's a business side of church that you have to know. You've got to be careful with numbers. You can't just have all this money coming in. People who don't have respect for money, they own a church, they want to be spending way too much on stuff, and they don't care. That's what governments do. It ain't their money. What do they care? Here's a million, here's a, here's a billion. Now we're talking trillions. You young guys, you ever hear these, them talk about trillions? They never talked about trillions when I was a kid. We had no idea. A trillion? That was a number they made up. Am I right, older folk here? Now trillion. Oh, it's a trillion dollar budget. Trillion? What's that? Well, if you stack dollar bills on top of each other, it goes about to the moon. Right? Is that right? Sai, how much is a trillion dollars? There you go. Mordecai, in caring for his, you know what's really cool? This story could end here, and it's like, wow, what a great story. She becomes queen, it's over, man. That's amazing. Wow, how God blesses people. Wow, how God lifts the hurting up from the ashes. We could use Bible verses galore, Old and New Testament, to say, story's over. Oh, but it's not. It's not even close to over. The plan of God hasn't even unfolded yet. For the plan for Esther's life, the plan for your life is greater than you. Let me reiterate that. The plan for your life is greater than you. And why am I encouraging you guys, gotta serve, gotta serve, gotta serve? Because the plan for our lives is greater than us. We talked about this on Sunday. God's got this amazing adventure for us. Look, right now, we got a lot of single people in our church. And I love that. I do. But know this. Sisters, keep loving God. Don't settle. God is going to raise up a man from among his people for you. When? I don't know that. I can tell you the story about Patricia O'Brien. Patricia O'Brien, you remember Patricia O'Brien, Tom? 41 years old. She waited 41 years. Yeah, I know you sisters are like, forget that noise. I know you are, and, and, and amen you should. This is the most extreme out of all of them, but I'm gonna tell you something about Patricia O'Brien. You ask her now, she'd wait every one of those days again for the life she has now. And I know this other girl, um, it's an old friend of Elena's, um, I don't remember her name, 17 years old, she got married, her and her, and her husband moved up to New York to help, um, 
to help Owen with his church up there. What was her name? Does anyone remember her name? No, no, not Judith. You think about Judith Rust. No, she, she lives down. Anyway, they've been up there now for 15 years, happily, four or five kids, doing great. He's now a senior pastor of his own church. Billy Penna, his name is. He's a pastor up there. Rebecca, maybe her name is. Elena will have to tell me later. And every place in between. But let me tell you what you don't do. Don't settle for Mr. Right Now. Because if you choose a man who loves you more than he loves the Lord, you will regret more days than you will be thankful for. The Bible says this, it is not good for man to be alone. I will raise up for him a suitable help meet. My brothers and my sisters who are now currently single, God has a man slash woman for you. If you will wait on that, and when you find it, you bring him to the Lord, you bring him to prayer, you bring him to the church, you introduce him to your pastor and your leaders, you introduce him to, and I'll tell you, did he go to your parents first? Did she do, is she, is she more in love with you than she is him? Is she, this ain't the one. I told you guys stories last week about the, the men that wanted to court my daughter Elena before Austin came along. I growl at them, I chase them away, I get in their face. And, and this is serious, and, and Elena was here, she'd tell you, I was voted for three years in a row the scariest father at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. That's like a coveted title. She went on a, a, um, a, a, a one time she went on a, um, a short term mission trip to somewhere in Central America, and some kid massaged her back. And I grabbed him by the throat and I put him up against the wall, and I told him, if you ever touch my daughter again, it will be the last woman you ever touch. And he went back and told his parents and told his pastor, you think I care? You think I care? You got the wrong guy here, because I ain't here for no show. That's my baby. You don't touch my baby. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care who you think. Well, I'll tell Pastor Bob. I don't care if you tell Pastor Chuck, and he's dead. So this dude is pacing around, worried about his baby girl, his cousin, who's now his baby girl. And in his pacing around, he hears these men talking. He hears this story. What's this? Plot against the king. He gets message to his cousin, to Hadassah, who is now called Esther. He says, listen, you tell your king that these two guys are plotting to kill him. So she gets message to the king and writes Mordecai's name. Loyalty. I could get favor from the king. I could, no, not this girl. This girl had much higher standards than herself. She knew that the plan that God had for her life was not just about her. And it comes back, they do this inquiry, it turns out that they are going to try and kill the king. The king finds out he takes the two of them. And now this is, this is not just important, but it's interesting. You see, it says they were hung from the gallows. You could circle that word right from gallows and you could write tree because that's not gallows like hangman. Listen, do you guys know who invented crucifixion? The Persians. Do you know when they did it? Right in this time. These men were crucified. Persians invented crucifixion. The Romans then took that as a way to start to um, torture and kill people. However, close your Bible. Remember what we talked about last week. The mention of God, the mention of worship, the mention of prayer, nowhere to be found. Zero. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, one of the reformers of the church, said the book of Esther does not belong in the canon of the Bible. 
but the very fingerprint of God is all over it. Just like our lives. When we don't see God in the details, when we're in a situation, a position, we say, where is God? Sit back. Let God open the bigger pictures of the situation to you, and you will see his fingerprint all over it. You've, he's never left you nor forsaken you. He's never going to leave you out there alone. Never. What we're about to see is so amazing. And again, historically speaking, the book of Esther is impeccably accurate. When it comes to the Persian Empire, when it comes to the Greek Empire, when it comes to the Romans coming in later, it's amazing. Historically perfect. To see the fingerprint of God. Truly, my pastor used to say this, and it's really interesting. He said, it's not history. It's his story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. It's amazing, God. I can't wait to see how you reveal and what you reveal to us. And I do pray for those whose, whose heart was touched today by your word for whatever, whether it was the, the story of Hadassah or the, or the some messages that we brought today. God, that you would reveal yourself to those who wait on the Lord. For they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They shall run and not faint. You shall restore our soul. May we believe that and live as if we know it's the truth. Amen. Amen.